So now that I spent all this time talking about how we can measure population size and abundance and distribution to an extent, we'll talk more about that, what do we do with this kind of information? Well, one of the things that ecologists have found out from doing this kind of sampling is that populations are very dynamic, okay? They vary in both size over time and in space, okay? So we've talked about this before, temporal and spatial variation. Population size can go up and down over time, and it can be different from one area to, a, to the next. And this particular example here of these little beetles is that you can look at some of this data and what you can see is that here we are in uh, around New York in New York State right the city is over here and um, near these lakes region right we have a number of these different lakes <clears throat> and there are uh, several different populations of this beetle, Trihabda virgata, okay, that live on these tall goldenrod plants. And um, if you went to Dr. Phillips' talk, you probably know what a goldenrod looks like by now. Um, and so there's <clears throat> 20 or more different study sites that are indicated by these little dots. Okay, so you go out to these study sites and, and sample these beetles in, in a number of different ways. And what you can see from this data is that if we if we sort of zero in on these graphs now, we can look at the number of these individuals per 100 centimeter stem. That's the units that we're looking at here. How many beetles per stem of a particular size are there? And what you can see is there's great variation over time, right? That the number of beetles um, per stem from 1981 to 1993 doesn't stay constant. If we just look at hectare for a minute, we see it goes up, it kind of goes down, it goes up again, it goes down. All right, the same thing is true for the other areas. Okay, so again, we see this variation in both time and in space. By spatial variation, I'm talking about those differences that we see between the three different study sites in this in this case uh, Hector, Maple Island, and Montezuma. Okay, are they the same? No, they're quite different. We see a lot more of these beetles in Hector, okay, although after 1989 in Maple Island they kind of peak and they're even higher than they are in Hector. So this spatial and temporal variation is really quite common for populations. So what are the things that influence how many organisms are found there and how they're distributed, right? What are the factors that influence population distribution and abundance? And um, as you can probably already guess, the suitability of the habitat in terms of abiotic and biotic factors is going to be really important. Again, we talked about this with respect to range um, earlier, but here we can look at the range of um, the barnacle, Semibalanus belenoides, and notice that its temperature range that it can occur is this whole area here, right? So it's limited by temperature to this point, okay? But its biotic interactions, its competition with other species ends up limiting it uh, to this point. So the suitability of the habitat in terms of both abiotic and biotic influences is, is one thing that influences population distribution and abundance. Another really important factor that influences um, populations is historical factors, okay? So we can ask questions like, um, why are polar bears only found in the Arctic but not in Antarctica? Because we can look at habitat suitability and, and look at temperatures and other factors of the abiotic environment and say there's no reason that we can think of from that point of view that polar bears shouldn't be in the south like they are in the north. And, and really the answer comes from the fact that this is where polar bears originated and e evolved, right? And that they just were not able to cross the equator to get into southern regions, all right? So it's a matter of history that they're found where they're found, okay? Um, another example is to look at the mammals of, um, in the Philippines, Okay, so let me enlarge this a little bit and point out that we're looking at 30 million years before the present, right? 
what did the arrangement of continents look like on the Earth 30 million years ago? Well, <clears throat> you all learned about continental drift at some point <laughs> in your education, I'm sure. And 30 million years ago, there was a big separation between the Philippines and between um, Australia here. Okay? The big gap of ocean. <clears throat> and that if you look only at present day distributions, if you look at the present, all right, you say, well, the Philippines look really close to New Guinea, right? And here, I should have pointed out the New Guinea is, is over here, right? So um, you can say, well, the Philippines, they actually have more species in common with those in Africa that are over 5,000 kilometers away than they do with families that are in New Guinea, um, which are only 750 kilometers away. Okay, and, uh, and based on recent time, the, these these are much closer to each other now that we might expect movement and dispersal. But 35 million years ago, or 30 million years ago, this region of ocean prevented these organisms from being able to get there. Okay, and that longer ago there was um, close connection between Africa. At least there was continuous landmass here so that organisms could roam across. So landmasses provide a much more suitable substrate for dispersal for these terrestrial organisms than, than the ocean would. All right, so these historical factors, just to summarize what I was talking about, these historical factors can help us answer the question, why is this species found here? Why isn't it found there? That's a distribution question. How many of them are found there? Why is this species rare? Why is this species abundant? Those are abundance questions. Right? So <clears throat> historical factors play a big role. A third thing that we can look at that can limit population distribution and abundance is dispersal. Okay, so if a population is dispersal limited, then it's going to just kind of stay where it is. But if it's able to disperse out, then it's going to have a wider distribution. I think that sort of uh, seems like a no-brainer. <laughs> There's these uh, plant, particular uh, species of impatiens, impatiens capensis here, that um, was planted in 1987 in these particular areas, so that by 1988, it had moved to a couple of other areas. By 1989, it was now occupying this area here. And by 1990, it had spread to cover um, this larger area. And then here's our, our, here's our scale at the bottom here of about five meters. So you can see what we're talking about. And as you, you would expect that the abundance should just be increasing over time, and we see this drop. And um, even though the number of individuals kind of goes down in 1990 um, and then up again by 1991, uh, there may be fewer individuals, but the total area that they're occupying is much more spread out. Okay, so dispersal is influencing the distribution of these impatience. And we'd have to kind of ask questions and look at other factors for why the abundance dropped in this particular year. This data doesn't necessarily tell us why, but we can see this increasing distribution with increasing dispersal over time. So one thing we know, and one thing that becomes really important in applied ecology, in conservation ecology, is um, how big can a population get? Why are sometimes some populations really small, so small that they may be in danger of extinction? And other, other populations are really large and perhaps out of control, like this species right here. <laughs> we'll talk more about that species later. Um, <clears throat> one population... Um, that's really small is the devil's hole pupfish. Okay, so the geographic range of this pupfish is so small. Okay, these guys live in these small pools in in the desert, basically. So they're these limestone caverns. And um, if you can if you can read this sign here, what it's saying is that the entire population of this species. Cyprindo and Diabolus, if I'm saying that right, 
which is a type of desert pupfish, lives in this small pool at the bottom of this one cavern. Okay, most restricted environment of any animal in the world. Um, so it's in a very restricted environment. And if you read a little bit more about pupfish in your in your textbook, there are other species in this genus, and they do disperse by moving from one pool to another at times when it's um, a little bit rainier and there are some streams that can connect these pools together. Um, but when it's drier and these pools do dry up, then populations can become isolated and to the point where they may be so isolated that they don't join with other groups later. So here we see some, some real extremes in, in geographic range. One um, classification scheme that has been suggested by a researcher named uh, Deborah Rabinowitz uh, is to look at this scheme in terms of um, in terms of thinking about how abundant or rare a species is by looking at the geographic range, by looking at the habitat tolerance, and then looking at the local population size. Okay, so organisms or species can vary with respect to these three factors. They may have an extensive or restrictive range. Their habitat tolerance may be either broad or narrow. Okay, and then population sizes may be larger or smaller. Of course, these are just relative terms uh, within any of these particular habitats. And I'm going to go through a number of examples just kind of quickly here. But you can see how this has um, conservation implications. If we look at how this scheme plays out for the house sparrow, we can see that its geographic range is pretty extensive. And if you've ever been anywhere, you can probably see house sparrows just about anywhere in the world. So they have a very extensive geographic range. Um, their habitat tolerance, they can tolerate um, a broad range of habitats, and their population sizes are very large. Using uh, a Galapagos ground finch as another example, you can see that these guys actually are restricted to the Galapagos, so their geographic range is restricted. Um, but within their habitat, they have a pretty broad tolerance for habitat features. Okay, And so this um, often tends to cause their population sizes to be uh, quite large. The northern spotted owl, which is an endangered species, although it potentially has an extensive geographic range, you know, humans have limited that to an extent uh, to a certain extent because of the fact that its habitat tolerance is pretty narrow. Um, we find these owls in the tall coniferous, the northern coniferous forests, like the redwoods of California and Oregon, and because those have um, been influenced and impacted by humans, the local population size of these guys is pretty small, dangerously small. Another example of uh, endangered and threatened species, the, the California condor, which was nearly extinct until it was rescued and raised in captivity and then re-released, um, these guys have pretty restricted kinds of environments that they live in, in cliff kinds of areas. Um, but within those areas, again, they can tolerate a pretty broad range of habitats, but their populations are small, again, because of uh, human influences primarily. Finally, we look at an organism like the Everglades snail kite, which is um, probably one of the more um, species that's most threatened because of the fact that it has both a restricted geographic range in the Everglades and it has narrow habitat tolerance within that range and the population sizes are, are very small. So again, you can see that there's a, pretty, um, there's a pretty useful scheme for trying to classify different kinds of organisms in terms of their relative abundance and how conservation biologists can prioritize different species for different conservation methods, right? Which ones need attention now? And also, not just which species do we need to pay attention to, but what are the factors that we need to look at in order to help solve these issues?